Sorry. This is the other side of me, but which only my son knows. <laughs> when I order people around. No, I think everybody in my office knows it too, but please be seated. John, please be seated. Martin, please be seated. Palmer, please be seated. Okay. Anyway, um, we're thrilled to have uh, Judge Thomas Noonan Jr. with us. He's a senior U.S. federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Um, he has a rather stunning uh, history and bio. He's among his 14 books are studies of usury, contraception, marriage and divorce, abortion and bribery, judicial ethics, and canon law. He's been the Mia Deer Lecturer at the University of Virginia Law School, the Litowitz Lecturer at Yale Law School, the Holmes Lecturer at Harvard Law School, and the Erasmus Lecturer at the University of Notre Dame. He was consultant to the Papal Commission on Problems of the Family. A member of the special staff of the National Se Security Council under President Eisenhower, he has been a Boston lawyer and the chairman of the Brookline, Massachusetts Redevelopment Authority. But that's not what he's really famous for. <laughs> he's really famous for the decision in Lazo Mahano, um, and I'll, he's going to talk about it, So I, and I've already said a word or two about it, but um, it's... Uh, it's what has inspired me, certainly, in everything I've done. Um, long before any of us imagined, long before we drafted the gender guidelines, long before um, uh, any of us thought that gender could be a factor in, in asylum, um, uh, he understood that, uh, um, that a woman, a poor woman from Guatemala who couldn't even you know, who was, who was, uh, who was like basically a sex and domestic slave of a, a sergeant in the army, that her resistance by leaving he, um, was a, an expression of political opinion. Um, he understood the voice of the voiceless. Um, he wasn't briefed on any of this. None of us had thought of any of it. Um, so I make this a part of my, the curriculum. I demand that it be in there. It's part of... Um, it's still a wonderful, alive decision, and, um, and we're so honored to have him here today. Thank you, Judge Noonan. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your very generous introduction. It's such a pleasure to be back in a way at the law school uh, I was a student both at the college and in the law school, and uh, it always evokes uh, nostalgia when I'm back in any way. I want to begin by saluting the Harvard Immigration and Refugee Program. I join in the celebration of its 30th anniversary. Its indomitable staff has made the legal system an instrument of compassion. They have put the power of law at the service of the poor and the persecuted. As has been indicated, as a contribution to this happy occasion, I want to commemorate a case that has played a part in the development. Of immigration law. I had sat hearing argument in only one other session of the appeals court when I heard the case of Olympia Mazo Mahan. Immigration law was a field foreign to my experience. I had never had an immigration case in private practice. 
I had never taught an immigration case in teaching professional responsibility. I was aware, however, that aliens as a class were treated differently from and worse than citizens. In that respect, a lawyer's responsibility to them was higher, for they were partially disabled to act for themselves. A point that I had made in teaching professional responsibility, using a case involving a lawyer for a slave in Alabama before the Civil War. I was familiar with the biblical injunction, you too must love the alien, for you once lived as aliens in Egypt. A passage read aloud at my installation as a judge. And I had the help of a law clerk, John McGuire. Who held the doctorate in sociology from Berkeley, where Robert Bella had rated him as among the most brilliant students ever in the department. What would a judge do without law clerks? McGuire led me within the contours and around the crevices of the system that governed the admission of aliens as refugees into the United States. A judge deals with precedents and principles. A judge also interacts with persons. The judge can sometimes overlook the persons as his attention is focused on the law. But the judge's acts always affect persons, real, living, breathing humans. These creatures should not be reduced to a statistical norm, to a weighted average, to a generalization, to a mass. Attention to the person will lead to the discovery of a principle and even to the creation of a precedent. More fundamentally, attention to the person is attention to the being at the center of the case. Such was my experience with the case of Olympia Lazo-Mahana. The suggestion today to speak about her case came from my wife, Mary Lee so often in the unseen inspiration of my thinking. Olympia, as I referred to her for humanity's sake, in the opinion, what mock formality to call her Patricia or Mrs. Lazo Mahano. She was, in the formula used in such cases, seeking review of the decision of the Board of Immigration Appeals that has affirmed the decision of an immigration judge. A refugee from El Salvador, she had asked for the remedies offered by our on law to a victim of persecution, the withholding of deportation, a grant of asylum. She had been denied both. 
if we granted a petition and sent the case back to the board, it was highly likely that she would be granted relief. Her story was unchallenged by the Immigration Service and was assumed to be true by the immigration judge and the board. Her story ran as follows. She was 34 years old, married, and the mother of three children. In 1981, when she was 29, her husband left El Salvador for political reasons. He had been in the rightist paramilitary group known as Orden. When he quit, he was wanted by the guerrillas and distrusted by the government. Olympia had always lived in the same small town. For five years, she had been working as a domestic for another woman, getting a day off every 15 days. In the middle of April 1982, she received a telephone call from Sergeant Rene Zuniga, who had known her since childhood. He asked her to wash his clothes. Olympia agreed. On a day off during the next six weeks, Olympia worked for Zuniga at Zuniga's place. Zuniga then pointed out that Olympia's husband was no longer in El Salvador. And from this fact, drew his conclusions. In Olympia's own words, with a gun in his hand, he made me be his. In the following months, Olympia accepted Zuniga's domination. She continued to wash from on her days off. She accepted taunts, threats, and beatings from him. He broke her identity card in pieces and forced her to eat the pieces. He dragged her by the hair about a public restaurant. He pummeled her face causing a blood clot to form in one eye. She thought she had lost the eye. She was nervous, preoccupied, and depressed. Ate little and became thin and frail. She wanted to escape her tormentor, but saw no way of doing so. Central to the situation was the fact that Zuniga was a sergeant in the Fuerza Amida, the armed force, which is the Salvadoran military. Zuniga used his gun in forcing Olympia to submit the first time. On another occasion, Zuniga held two hand grenades against her forehead. On another occasion, he threatened to bomb her. When he referred to her husband, Zuniga said that if her husband returned, Zuniga himself would cut him apart, kill Olympia as well, and say that they were both subversive. Zuniga informed Olympia that it was his job to kill subversives. Zuniga said to Olympia that if, he, if she ever told on him, he would have her tongue cut off, her nails removed, one by one, her eyes pulled out, and she would then be killed. As a Negro recalled his statement, he said, and I can just say that you are contrary to us, subversive. When he was angry with her in the restaurant, he told a friend from the police in front of all the other people in the restaurant that she was a subversive, and that was why her husband had left, because she was a subversive. Olympia believed that the armed force 
would let Zuniga carry out his threat. She believed that in 1979, a 19-year-old boy she knew by sight had been tied, tortured, and killed by the armed force. That in 1981, the husband of a neighbor had been taken away in a truck at night with 15 others and killed by the armed force. That the armed force had raped young college girls as had Zuniga himself. In her view, there was nobody in El Salvador that could stop the armed force from doing such things. In her experience, when Zuniga was dragging her by the hair in the restaurant, no one helped, because where the armed force was concerned, I quote, no one will get involved. The Zuniga's treatment of Olympia constituted persecution was beyond dispute. Three questions remain, the first of which was, had she not consented to his conduct? To that question, an opinion in another case by Judge Harry Craigerson, a fellow panel member, provided a compelling answer. Judge Craigerson had commented on the acquiescence of the victim of a kidnapping, where the defendant had urged that the victim's acquiescence absolved him of any crime. To the contrary, Judge Bregerson denied the defense and noted that the victim's passivity presented a pattern all too familiar of a victim identifying with the aggressor under conditions of terror. The victim lacked sufficient ego strength self-confidence and willpower to escape or to cry out for help. So too, Olympia's identification with a persecutor did not transform the persecution into collaboration. My analysis of Olympia's conduct came perilously close to fact-finding an activity, as you know, forbidden to an appellate court. In my judgment, her psychology was implicit in her story. Accepting her account as fact, as had the BIA, we accepted the psychology written on its face. The second question was, were Zuniga's acts those of the government? The law attributes to a government those acts that the government is unable or unwilling to restrain. I thought it evident that Zuniga had impunity to do what he wanted to with Olympia. He acted as a member of the armed force, a military power that exercised domination over much of El Salvador, despite some efforts of the Duarte government to restrain it. Zuniga had his gun, his grenades, his bombs, his authority, and his hold over Olympia because he was a member of this powerful military group that the government lacked power to control. The third question was the most difficult. Wazo Mahano, the government confidently asserted, had to demonstrate that she had a political opinion for which he was persecuted by Zuniga. Here, her case collapsed. 
There is no evidence in the record, the government declared, to support petitioner's contention that Zuniga was persecuting her for her political opinion. First, nothing in the record indicates what, if any, political opinion petitioner held. The government stated the facts accurately. At no point had Olympia expressed a political opinion for which he had been persecuted. As the government saw it, Zuniga's conduct was deplorable, a sadomasochistic relation between two sweethearts. It was not an implausible contention. Yet were these all the facts in Olympia's case? It seems to me that there was more to be considered. Zuniga had maintained his hold over Olympia by attributing to her a political opinion. She would be killed as a subversive, Zuniga had told her, if she complained about him. She was a subversive, Zuniga had told the restaurant. Olympia herself was innocent of any political beliefs. Treated as the enemy of the country, she became subject to persecution on account of a political opinion assigned by her persecutor. Because of that attribution, Olympia had to suffer the series of sexual acts that everyone saw as persecution. I concluded that Olympia met the criteria for relief. In my opinion, I went further than was necessary in order to specify a second political opinion on whose account Olympia feared future persecution. If the situation was seen in a social context, Zuniga was asserting the political opinion that a man has a right to dominate women. He had persecuted Olympia to force her to accept this opinion without rebellion. Zuniga told Olympia that in his treatment of her, he was seeking revenge. Olympia knew of no injury she had ever done to Zuniga. His statement reflected a much more generalized animosity to the opposite sex, an assertion of a political conviction on the place of men in the society and a determination to enforce it. By itself, such an assumption would not constitute persecution. It has been the common assumption of many societies. It was only when such an assumption was accompanied by a man's threatened use of political force in order to subject a woman to the sexual surges of the man that the woman suffered. Persecution on account of the political opinion she was assigned to accept. Olympia was not permitted by the Zuniga to hold an opinion to the contrary. When by flight she asserted one, she became exposed to persecution for her assertion. Future persecution threatened her because of this political opinion. This probability 
of future political persecution was a second independent reason for granting relief. As you know, an alien is entitled to withholding of deportation if it is more likely than not that she would be persecuted on account of her political opinion if deported to her native land. That means there has to be a 51% chance of persecution. An alien is entitled to asylum in the discretion of the Attorney General. If she has a well-founded fear of persecution on account of her political opinion, to meet this standard, the chances have to be one in ten. We held that the board to whom the Attorney General's discretion had been delegated had abused that discretion in denying her asylum, and that the board's decision denying withholding a deportation was not supported by substantial evidence. The chances are one in 10, even more than five in 10, that she would suffer at Zuniga's hands if she were sent back. Judge Preggerson was the other judge constituting the we issuing this opinion. My third colleague dissented. He wrote, I quote, the record here shows a Salvadoran woman, Mazo Mahano, who is abused and dominated by an individual purely for sexual and clearly ego reasons. Neither petitioner nor her tormentor was politically motivated in any sense contemplated by the laws granting asylum to aliens. The holding that as a matter of law, Liza Mahano was persecuted on account of political opinion is a construct of pure fiction. Our dissenting colleague took special umbrage at our view of the political nature of the future persecution that Olympia feared. He wrote, I quote, quite simply, the majority is dug down Lewis Carroll in its application of the term political opinion and in finding that male domination in such a personal relationship constitutes political persecution. This judge did not think Zuniga's threats to treat Olympia as a subversive were credible. The threats, he wrote, were effective because she was unsophisticated enough to believe that this low-grade bully tyrant might make him trouble. The dissenter did not acknowledge that Zuniga appeared to be unrestrained by the government of El Salvador. For him, the relationship between Zuniga and Olympia was not political, but personal. Jim Browning, our chief judge, a man characterized by modesty, good sense, and kindness, was sufficiently taken aback by the tone of the dissent that he took the unusual step of speaking to the dissenter about it before the decision was issued. Go home and read your dissent to your wife, he advised. <laughs> I don't believe this advice was heeded. <laughs> Given the spirit of dissent, it was not surprising that the government 
sought rehearing by the panel and rehearing on bank by the court. We had, we were informed by the government's petition, transmogrified immigration law by our view that machismo could constitute a political opinion whose assertion would be political. Transmogrify, a word that sounds formidable, but whose meaning is unknown to most who hear it. <laughs> Webster says the word means to change in form, appearance, or structure, often with grotesque or humorous effect. I assume that the government was contending that our effect was grotesque. We deny the petition. No judge asked for rehearing on bank. Certiorari was not sought. The central holding remains the law that the political opinion that the persecutor attributes to his victim is decisive in determining on what account the asylum seeker has been persecuted. Unsighted to us by the parties and undiscovered by us and our law clerks was Hernandez Ortiz against the INS, Ninth Circuit, 1983. An opinion by Judge Stephen Reinhart, joined by Judge Robert Bucciva and Judge Dorothy Nelson. The opinion in that case turned on the ability of a refugee from El Salvador to reopen deportation proceedings. In the course of the opinion, Judge Reinhart wrote, moreover, it is irrelevant whether a victim actually possesses any of these opinions, as long as the government believes that he does. Our case took the principle enunciated by Judge Reinhart one step further in recognizing that a persecutor could make up the belief that he chose to persecute. The significance of the decision was at once noted by the Los Angeles Times in a column on April 3rd, 1987, by staff writer Kim Murphy. As its headline accurately stated, I quote, court broadens rules for political refugees. If you follow the history of our case in West, you will find the notation overruled on other grounds. The reference is to Fisher against the INS, Ninth Circuit, 1999, where an on-bank court simply disapproved, I quote, taking notice of reports supporting petitioners' asylum claim. Notice of such reports was peripheral to our decision in Lazo Mahano. Fisher's reference was a gratuitous gesture, unsuccessful in lessening the luster of our case. The judge does not usually follow the life of the litigant after the litigation is over. Today's occasion has led me to see what became of Olympia. Thanks to the efforts of our court librarian in Phoenix, she has been discovered. This year, the librarian located her and arranged for me to telephone her. 
On May 9th, a little over a month ago, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking to her. She responded graciously, even complimenting me on my elementary Spanish. <laughs> the climax of discovering her was to learn that on August 21, 2008, she had become a citizen of the United States. I turned from the life of the litigant to the more familiar area of the life of the law. The law of this case goes on, alive and well. Lazo Mahano has been cited at least nine times in district court habeas actions, over 60 times in decisions by federal courts of appeal, as many as 153 times in secondary authorities, more than a thousand times in briefs and auxiliary documents. Within a year of its decision, it was followed by Judge Thomas Tang writing for a unanimous panel in the Zierville Ilchert, 9th Circuit, 1988. It has been cited as recently as Rogerado Escobar v. Holder, 9th Circuit, 2013. The case has never been noticed by the Supreme Court. However, a decision of the Supreme Court, INS against Elias Zacharias in 1992, appeared to some to endanger its life. The petitioner, a citizen of Guatemala seeking asylum, had been visited by guerrillas who attempted to conscript him. Fearing government retaliation, he refused. The guerrillas then threatened him. The immigration judge held that he had not shown persecution of political opinion. He had simply suffered a random threat of violence. We reversed, holding that the guerrillas had imputed a political opinion to him. The guerrillas then had persecuted him for holding it. In an opinion by Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court, six to three, reversed the circuit. Elias Zacharias' unwillingness to take sides was not necessarily a political opinion. The ordinary meaning of persecution on account of political opinion is persecution on account of the victim's political opinion. On its face, nothing in this case casts a shadow on Lazo Mahano. It was, however, clear that the Supreme Court focused exclusively on the petitioner's belief or lack thereof. No attention was given to the view of him by his persecutors, the guerrillas. Did this approach signal a repudiation of Lazo Mahano? In a thoughtful article in the 2006 Immigration Law Review, Donald W. U., Assistant Chief Counsel of the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement, explored this question. U. was not enthusiastic about what he seemed to perceive as an anomalous Ninth Circuit approach. Yet picking his way cautiously, you did not charge the circuit with flouting the Supreme Court. He noted that in 1993, the general counsel of the INS had issued an opinion letter stating that the petitioner qualified on the basis of a protected characteristic erroneously imputed to him. In 2000, the attorney general 
had issued new regulations that incorporated this rule. In 2003, the rule was applied in the case of a Ghanaian persecuted on account of the homosexuality that was attributed to him by his persecutors. In this case, Amalfia against Ashcroft, the Third Circuit observed that persecution on any of the five protected grounds could be the basis for asylum when the persecutors erroneously attributed the characteristic to the petitioner. So, for example, the circuit observed a non-Jew persecuted by the Nazis as a Jew could obtain asylum. Donald Yu appeared to regret this development. His article concluded, and I quote, the danger lies in the fact that the mere words or actions of the persecutor can be pivotal and perhaps ultimately determinative. Why is it a danger that the words or actions of the persecutor should be pivotal? Are we not determining whether the alien has been persecuted on the basis of a protected characteristic? Why does the title of Yu's article imply that the doctrine of imputed political opinion is peculiarly a Ninth Circuit approach? Is Yu's article, in Yu's article, a resistance to wholehearted acceptance of Lazo Mahano smolder? I return at the end of this presentation to the macro level, to all the persons seeking, living, seeking to live here. On the level of the system, the figures speak. There are only 231 immigration judges. They complete more than 280,000 proceedings each year. An average of 1,243 per year for each judge. The Department of Homeland Security removes 358,000 non-citizens each year. I cannot report these numbers without a sense of the immensity of the case law and its overwhelming impact upon our system as it now stands. As you know, the American Bar Association commissioned Arnold and Porter in 2010 to make a comprehensive review of the system. I cannot improve on Arnold and Porter's excellent study and equally excellent recommendations. The problems identified by the study cry out. Why are they not addressed? The amount of money needed to provide the necessary remedies would be significant, but far from being beyond federal resources. I don't believe that money is lacking. At the root is the immunity of elected lawmakers from those who cannot vote. Those who speak for the immigrant are not enough to sway them. The consciences and the consciousness of our legislators need to be invigorated. Individual cases serve this purpose. Olympia Lazo Mahano's successful journey to citizenship lights the way. Judge Leonard Hand famously said in the Alcoa case, 
the power and its exercise must needs coalesce. Our legislators have the power. Let the coalescence commence. Thank you so much, Judge Noonan. You've uh, you transformed this area of law. You've made possible the development of asylum law, and uh, and we're eternally grateful to you and to the historic decision in Lazo Mahano. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again. Now you're all here when I want you to. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how much more time we have for this panel. 10 minutes? What? 10 minutes? I don't know if anybody has a question or two for Judge Noonan. It's uh, hard to do long distance. <laughs> So I think I think we'll close this up for now and end up having a little bit of a break. Thank you so much for uh, th letting us take you through a very quickly paced morning, and uh, we'll break a few minutes, and then we'll have lunch and a lunch panel. Of course, we're not going to let you eat in peace. So, thank you all. <laughs>